Good evening, everybody. My name is Wally Lavernier. I am the lead ecologist at Fermilab, and tonight I will be talking about the importance of prairie restorations using Fermilab as an example. I think many people think of images similar to these when we all, when we all thought, think about what an ecologist does. But let's not forget about the other portions of the job. It's only scratching the surface. Every day is unique and challenging. Communicating with stewards, wildlife and rare plant monitors, the lab and public is critical to, to be successful and have functional natural areas. Many people are familiar with Fermilab's natural areas, but far fewer know how it started. Before Fermilab existed, much of the area was farmed. In 2007, 2008, Fermilab Creative Services published a video titled Part and Parcel of the Prairie, which talks about the origins of Fermilab's prairie and highlights the work of Dr. Robert Betts at the lab. Dr. Betts was a professor at Northeastern University but his passion was in the prairie. He was a uh, pioneer at lar of large scale prairie restorations and this all occurred at Fermilab. In the video, the narrator says, part of the concept of the founding director, Robert Wilson, was that the Fermilab community would take responsibility for keeping that place healthy. He saw restoring the prairie as one aspect of the stewardship of the land. And now we're gonna watch Dr. Betts's recollection on how the prairies began at Fermilab. When he learned that Fermilab's director had requested landscaping advice from the Morton Arboretum in Lyle, Illinois, he was encouraged, and the seeds of the Fermilab prairie were sown. So the, I, I came back uh, from the conference, and I, I, I got on the phone, and I called the lab, and I wanted to talk to Dr. Wilson. I felt I was going to go right to the top. Why well, start at the bottom and work up? Go right to the top. So I, I called Dr. Wilson. I didn't get him, but I got his, his assistant. And uh, he, uh, he told me, uh, I'll talk to Dr. Wilson. So a th short time later, he called me again. He said, Dr. Wilson is interested in your project. So the next day, I came to the Fermi lab and uh, visited him in his office and talked to him about the project. And he said, I think we might be able to start a project like this. He said, probably in the accelerator ring. And so uh, he said, uh, Dr. Betts, he said, how long do you think this project is, it would take to build that prairie that you're thinking about, this large prairie? I said, well, I said, I don't know. It's never been done before because we're starting from the scratch. We're starting with agricultural soils and been plowed and cultivated for 150 years. I said, and what do we, I said, uh, uh, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40, 50, and I finally, I, I didn't say any more because it was going out of this world. You know, I said, it might even take a hundred years or more. I said, I don't know. And he said, well, if that's the case, I said, we think we should start this afternoon. That meeting started the conversion of the landscape to prairie. Planting started in 1975 and here we are 45 years later with hundred acres of prairie restored from agriculture. The landscape you see today was due to the foresight of Dr. Wilson and Dr. Betts. This has been a community assisted project since the beginning and has been a large benefit of the plants and animals that call the prairie home. Being able to work in the natural areas with this history is unique and I'm humbled to continue the legacy of those that came before me to bridge the next generation of ecologists. At the time frame of the meeting of Dr. Wilson and Dr. Betts, the outlook for prairies wasn't that great. Illinois is the, called the prairie state. According to Illinois Department of Natural Resources, 60% of Illinois was once prairie, which has covered about 22 million acres. Illinois Natural Areas Inventory conducted um, surveys of remaining natural areas and published their findings in 1978, and they found that 2,300 acres of original prairie remained, which is also called remnant, and that's one hundredth of one percent. So here's a view of, a, of one of the remaining remnants at Fermilab, and we have a few acres of this left. So this is what settlers may have seen as they were moving through the area. Of course, there was no power lines during that time, but. Um, Let's now move on to a comparison to Fermilab. The Fermilab campus that you see off to the right is about 6,800 6, acres. If we were to take one hundredth of 1% of that, that would be 68 hundredths of an acre remaining. It's easy to see the lab would no longer function with these four small fragments. All the lab employees would be out of a job. Employees that are specialized may not be able to, be able to find other work. This comparison highlights the difficulty that plant and animal populations have had to try to adapt to. Without creating space for them or trying to reconnect the fragmented landscape, individual populations become isolated, smaller, and may die out over time, putting full species at risk. 
a study conducted by Cornell University, American Birding Conservancy, and five other institutions published in Science in 2019 concluded that we've lost 3 billion birds since 1970. And the study also included that grassland birds are the hardest hit with a decline of 53% in that time frame. <clears throat> so that pattern holds true for most prairie plants and animals. Um, and you know it's hard adapting to a, a changing planet. <clears throat> so prairies support many unique plant and animal species that occur in no other ecosystem. These species also, also depend on each other to survive. One can save the birds, but you also have to protect the insects that they feed on. In turn, you have to protect the things that the insects feed on. You may be able to remove one species in the prairie and it would still function, but like spokes in a wheel, you remove too many and the wheel would collapse. <clears throat> As you see in this final picture of the slide, Northern Harriers like wide open spaces like many prairie species. Besides biodiversity, prairies have many other benefits, including removing nutrients through water filtration, reducing flooding by having high absorption rates of water, and sequestering carbon. So a pretty cool fact about Fermilab is that it's a national environmental research park, which allows other institutions to come in and collect and conduct environmental studies at the lab. Argonne National Lab is one of the studies that has been, or one of the groups that has been studying at the lab. And they've been studying here for almost 40 years. During that time, one of the things they've looked at is how long it takes a prairie restoration to accumulate enough carbon to have similar levels as a remnant. They found the answers about 450 years in soil and uh, a fair amount less for leaf and stem material, root material, and microbial. <clears throat> the second graph shows that um, about in the first 100 years, you regain about half of that lost um, carbon. And it should be noted that these graphs only show, only relate to carbon. We don't really know how long it takes for the biodiversity to return. It could be shorter, it could be longer. <clears throat> There's many things that we're still working on. Less fragmentation is critical for species that need larger areas, may not have the ability to move easily. What can ecologists do about missing pieces in restored prairies like the bison? Bison graze heavily on grasses where many other large herbivores feed more on wildflowers and even shrubs. Bison do a great job of creating microhabitats and diversity and structure that different animals needs. <clears throat> One possibility is using hemiparasitic plants like this wood betony to create structural diversity in prairies by feeding off energy of other plants. Ecology takes a great amount of planning, effort, and communication to make it successful. And also, as Dr. Betts alluded to, it takes a lot of time for prairies to develop. To make a difference, we all need to do our part. Try to be an ecologist in your own yard. Start by trying to make one change. When you feel comfortable, you can add more. Um, Learn about plants and animals in your ecosystems. Support local groups that restore ecosystems. You can plant native species in your yard. Not only does it benefit the wildlife, but it also benefits your gardens because they pollinate your, your vegetables. You can be a messy homeowner. You can mow less and let your leaves remain over winter. Um, a lot of insects and things use leaf litter to overwinter. Keep your pets indoors and supervised. Um, prevents aggravating wildlife and also um, it's migration season, so keeping your lights off at night um, uh, helps uh, migrating birds. On a final note, here's a, some pictures of animals that I've observed in my um, native prairie plants at home. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Hi, I'm Elena. I'm a neutrino physicist at the lab, and uh, I made um, a small movie. Um, it's it's about uh, neutrinos, and it's about you. Welcome on board the Skin ARW three five seven ship. This is EG eighty seven, your artificial navigation assistant. It's nice to see you again, Captain. I hope you're having a good day. Let me give you today's briefing. Mission name, Silent Thread. Mission objective, explore neutrino sources. Medium, skin ARW357 sensory stimulation, visuals and sounds. List of action items. Suspension of disbelief. 
reality, detachment, immersion in parallel universe, security level classified, danger level high. Are you brave enough to accept the mission? I thought so. Let me guide you to process initiation. Please put your video on full screen. Make sure you're wearing your headphones. Close your eyes. Get comfortable. Sharpen your ears. Take a deep breath and feel the weight of your body resting on your feet. You're ready to move to the target parallel universe. In this universe, we can see and feel neutrinos. Take a deep breath. Initiation completed. Open your eyes. We are in the heart of the Earth. It's silent. Maybe just a few potassium beta decays. But in the mantle, and mostly in the crust, potassium, uranium, and thorium burst a sea of geoneutrinos. Many neutrinos come from the sun, based in their 
perform. galaxies far away, rumbling hordes of neutrinos are trapped in stars by the yoke of gravity. They dance and they fight until their victory ignites supernovae. Vital elements pollinate the universe. Are you ready to go back where neutrinos are invisible? But don't worry about losing them. The silent set continues in your bones. Hi everyone, my name is Jimmy McLeod and today I'll be sharing my presentation titled Listen Up, Why Personal Stories and Current Events Matter in the Quest for EDI. Uh, throughout today you'll hear a series of personal stories from me um, and you'll I'll also touch on current events. Uh, stories are important because they help us understand who we are and how we differ from other people. Please understand that whether you're a world-renowned physicist or, or a high school student, you have a valuable story um, and so do I. Um, a current event that uh, I'll never forget happened on March 11th, uh, 2020, and that man to your right, uh, his name is Rudy Gobert. Uh, Rudy tested positive for COVID-19 on that day, and then he, the entire NBA shut down uh, for four months. 
on March 10th, uh, COVID-19 was someone else's problem. And on, on March 11th, it was partially mine because of that crept into my world. And I could hear the stories of someone that I recognized. Uh, Rudy's story, Rudy Gobert's story made it real for me. Before I go too far into the stories of others, I should probably tell you who I am, right? So I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and my parents were born and raised in the Jim Crow South. And what that means, for those of you who don't know, is Jim Crow was basically a set of rules that kept people segregated. So these are your white-only restrooms, your black-only restrooms, things like that. Believe it or not, my parents actually recall they were in elementary school when schools were first integrated in the South. So their schools went from being black-only to where white and black students could attend school together. And I have no doubt that that experience and hearing those stories shaped who I am and why I do the work that I do in the equity, diversity, and inclusion space, because I want to create uh, environments that are continuously more and more welcoming. I went to Cleveland Public Schools for most of my life um, until I got to high school because Cleveland Public Schools were graduating people at a 38% rate at that time, and my parents wanted me to have slightly better odds than that. I'm a first-generation college student, which means my parents didn't attend college. I've lived all over the U.S., which I take pride in because I've experienced a bunch of different places. I'm also, I didn't fly until I was 24 years old, but now I've visited almost every state. Um, and, and now a traveler is always added to my story. And I don't have a background in STEM, but I was able to work in Fermilab. You know, I was able to use my story of working in higher education to my story of working in corporate diversity to bring that to Fermilab. Um, so all of these things are part of my story and they make me who I am and I can't leave any of them behind because then I wouldn't be the same person. So I want you to be cognizant of how that relates to your life and then how you can use that to relate to the lives of others. Uh, these are two of my favorite artists. They tell very different stories from different perspectives, but uh, they've been equally as, port as important to me in the, in the rap game. Uh, Jay-Z on your left was my favorite rapper and I think the best rapper ever of my childhood and uh, we grew up in similar inner city environments, even though he grew up in New York and was a lot older than me. I could relate to the stories he was telling as I was coming of age. Uh, the person to your right is Drake. He's very famous and um, we're relatable now. I, I relate to him now because we're the same age and he, minus the fame and wealth, we, we're experiencing similar things in life. And so the stories that they tell are equally valuable and, and they kind of speak to me at different parts of my life, but they allow me to connect and con to them and connect with others because of the stories we're able to share. And that brings us to May 25th, 2020. And this is a day that I will certainly never forget. And I know that's the case for many others as well. And that was the day that uh, George Floyd was murdered. Uh, many people had thought that uh, prior to that, black voices were being hyperbolic with expressing their fear of law enforcement. But after watching George Floyd die on camera, it forced people around the world to listen to his story and the stories of many others like him. Um, and um, it's really allowed for people to unite and mobilize to create change. Uh, now let's take a deeper look and dissect why our stories matter so much. It matters because you're a collection of a bunch of different things. Imagine how boring we'd be if we limited ourselves to only being one thing. Like picture, picture you're a dancer and, and a chef. I tell you that you have to pick one identity and stick with it. So if you choose to be a dancer, you have to stop cooking and vice versa. That's ridiculous, right? Your ability to be a dancer and a chef make you the person you are. That's a term called uh, intersectionality. Uh, maybe you dance while you cook like I do, so it's a package deal. You can't do one without the other. Uh, don't limit yourself and put yourself in a box. Stories can create space for different cultures to enter. Um, once you understand your story, uh, you're now responsible for making space for someone else's story to exist. Stories also help you consider what else might be true. If someone cuts you off while you're driving, you might think they're a bad driver. But what if they're rushing to the hospital to see a loved one, or maybe they, they got fired from their job today and now they're very distracted? Consider all of the potential hidden details to someone's story before you pass too much judgment. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but there is a show on Netflix called Last Chance You, and it follows a community college basketball team in Los Angeles through the 2019-2020 uh, uh, season. And uh, one of the main characters, his name is Deshaun Heiler. And during an episode, uh, the interviewer asked Deshaun, uh, what do people say about you? And then Deshaun says, well, they say I'm quiet, they say I'm hard to read, and they say I'm a jerk. And the interviewer says, well, what, do, what would you like to say to those people? And then Deshaun says, I think I'm going through the hardest part of my life. Because what we don't know and what other people don't know is that Deshaun is 20 years old and he lost his mom to cancer at 17. He's been raising himself with uh, very little money and very few resources. 
Um, and that has to be rough. And I imagine that might make anyone a jerk. That might certainly make me a jerk if, if I had to deal with all that stuff by 20 years old. Uh, but without allowing him to tell his story, we lose all of that important context and we, we judge a book by its cover incorrectly. To avoid uh, writing people off before you hear their story, like many people did Deshaun Hyler um, in Last Chance You, it's, it's best to start by addressing your own cultural bias. So cultural bias is the interpretation of situations based on the standards of one's own culture. Basically, that means it's assuming that your culture is the, is the standard and creates the norm without accounting for the fact that someone else may see the world completely differently and have a completely opposite set of cultural norms in their, in their environment. This brings me to uh, one of the first times that I witnessed a cultural bias of mine, and that was when my best friend and I went to New Orleans for his birthday. Uh, at the time, he and I both worked at colleges, and so we were always fascinated by visiting college campuses whenever we traveled. And this was our first time in New Orleans, so we wanted to see some of the local schools. And to get there, we took the famous St. Charles Street trolley that you see in this photo. And uh, we sparked a conversation with a young lady while we were on the trolley and she asked where we were going and we told her, um, she said, you know, I'm 27 years old and I've never, can you believe I've never been on a college campus? This was something that I had never considered because my high school took us on college visits, right? So in my head, you, you're exposed to colleges, like this is something that everyone has, but that's not the case. So she decided to follow us. And when we got to the second campus, she called her mom and broke down into tears because she had never envisioned herself physically being on a college campus. So fast forward a bunch of years later, um, in April of 2020, I get an invite to a virtual graduation from Louisiana State University, and it was actually from this young lady. And I thought that that was incredible. Um, and we impacted her because she had now met people who looked like her who actually graduated from college. And I was able to meet someone who taught me not to assume that everyone was encouraged to go to college like I was. Um, and that it's also never too late to write another, a new chapter to your story. This makes me think of something called a lollipop moment that I learned about from a TED Talk a few years back. Lollipop moments are special moments where one individual positively shapes uh, another person's life, um, whether or not they realize it. And um, I'm just glad that I was able to give her a lollipop moment, um, and I hope she appreciates it. Maybe I should tell her that she also gave one to me as well. I encourage you all to practice cultural humility um, this basically means reflecting on how your story impacts the situation and interaction. Um, and also, you can think about it as being able to read the room. Like, you need to understand how your story exists within a room uh, while making the space for other stories to be told. I imagine many of you are probably asking yourself, Jimmy, what does this have to do with physics? I thought this was a physics slam. Well, it's connected to physics because you bring your story everywhere you go. Um, if you decide to work in a physics or a STEM lab in general, your story comes with you. You learn from your past to better your future. Uh, learning from the stories of others and your own story helps you grow a greater appreciation for uh, differences and ideas and strengths and perspectives, and all of those are important. According to the Scientific American Blog Network, uh, when considering scientific research and problem solving, people from different backgrounds tend to approach these topics differently. Makes sense, right? Um, these differences can bring new perspectives, and that perspective is needed to promote innovation. And physics and STEM in general are always pushing the limits of innovation, so different stories help bring that to light. In conclusion, I want to leave you with some things to, to take with you along your journey to add to your story. <laughs> Uh, remain curious. There is no need to assume when you can just listen to or read about the story of someone else. Remain invested in the full truth and gravity of someone's story. Don't wait for it to impact your life before you believe it's real. Remain aware that everyone's journey is not yours and everyone's truth is their own. And then remain connected to the world around you. Your breaking news is someone else's long-term reality. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, it was a pleasure and I appreciate your time and your attention. I really hope that I get to listen to some of your stories someday. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to write the next chapter of mine. Um, so I invite you to pay attention to those around you. Have a good one. Live from inside a giant Atari symbol, it's the first annual Emmys! Good evening, and welcome to the Golden Particles. I guess no one told the announcer, uh, we were originally going to be called the Emmys after German mathematician Emmy Noether. Her equations are all throughout particle physics, but we 
found out at the last minute that the Emmys was taken, so we had to rebrand. Um, apologize if anyone was confused or disappointed when they got here. Uh, but welcome to the Golden Particles. I am your host, Teeny Turner, and tonight we're here to honor the achievements by particles, experiments, and ideas in physics over the past year. And let me tell you, I'm a bit overwhelmed. There are some megawatt A-list stars here in the room. Gravity is here. I loved you in George Clooney. Uh, gravity directed the formation of galaxy clusters early in the universe's history. Though you probably know it best for that time, it threw you down a flight of stairs. Dark Energy is also here tonight. Welcome. Dark Energy makes up 70% of all the matter and energy in the universe. The other 30%, as we all know, is 5-hour energy. No, dark energy is a mysterious force that is accelerating the expansion of our universe. Scientists say they don't know what's causing it, but I think most everyone watching probably has a good idea about what causes accelerating expansion. It's donuts. We've all been there. Uh, quantum computers are here. No one really knows what that means, but everyone seems very excited about it. Quantum computers take advantage of weird phenomena that happen at the smallest scales, and could have applications in everything from cryptography to biology. And, you know, most importantly, quantum TikToks. I'm looking forward to both watching them and not watching them simultaneously. The CMS detector is joining us remotely from CERN. Researchers have been working on an upgrade to the timing mechanism that would allow the detector to take 30 billion pictures per second. Unfortunately, the Higgs boson still insists on making duck face in all of them. Stop it. The Axion is also here, my friends. The Axion is nominated as a dark matter candidate, alongside the WIMP and the Dark Photon. Uh, most people don't know that until a few years ago, the Axion was going by the name of Ax and working full-time as a body spray. Just goes to show, never give up on your dreams. Uh, finally, tonight, we are also honoring the Proton with the Cecil B. DeYang Mills Lifetime Achievement Award. No one has ever seen a proton decay, so, presumably, it's had a lot of time to get things accomplished. Before we get going, I want to take a moment to thank our hosts for the evening, the HFPA. Yes, that's the HEP Fundamental Particle Association. And the HEP stands for High Energy Physics. HFPA is brought to us by nested science acronyms, because if it's not nested, it's not not confusing. Now, on to the awards. Particle physics sits at the extremes. Researchers study the smallest building blocks of nature using the biggest detectors and the most powerful accelerators to make the most precise measurements. Our first award honors the ingenuity of particles that work so hard to remain hidden. The nominees for hardest particle to detect are neutrinos for their role in too fast, too furious to interact. The story of antisocial particles that refuse to interact through either the strong force or electromagnetism. Dark matter in Catch Me If You Can. Despite leaving hints of its existence across the galaxy, no one has successfully determined what dark matter is. Supersymmetric particles in Desperately Seeking Susie. The tale of the search for proposed particles that would explain the mass of the Higgs boson. And the award goes to Dark Matter. Dark Matter is accepting the award remotely. Let's go live to Dark Matter now. Unfortunately, it appears we have some technical issues. We have a bad connection to Dark Matter, but we do offer our warmest congratulations. We'll be right back with more awards from the Golden Particles after this message. Are you a national lab with a herd of picky bison? Yeah, me too. That's why I feed my furry friends fermions. Fermions combine the delicious flavors of leptons with the nutritional building blocks of quarks. It's a healthy treat they'll love. 
And I'll feel good knowing it's 100% gluon free. Fermions, from the makers of Positrons. Progress in particle physics is the result of hard work by dedicated individuals. And it is painstaking work, checking and rechecking, simulations and analyses. It's often incremental and rarely glamorous. It's not the kind of thing that can be captured in a single image. Our next award keeps that front of mind. The nominees for shiniest costume design are Muta E in The Transporter Solenoid. This experiment will look for the direct conversion of a muon into an electron. Rigorous testing of the magnets that will form the experiment's transport solenoid was completed in 2020. The Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment Protodune Detector in Some Like It Cold. Protodune is a test bed the size of a three-story house designed to assess technologies for the even bigger detectors planned for Dune. The detector is filled with liquid argon and operated at minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. PIP2 Accelerator Cavities in Jurassic Particles. Upgrades to the Fermilab Accelerator Complex will include a new linear accelerator made of several kinds of cavities. It will accelerate particles close to the speed of light and power many of Fermilab's experiments. And the award goes to... The Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, Proto Dune. Dune couldn't be here tonight as the experiment is currently moving 800,000 tons of rock from a mile underground to make space for the full-size particle detectors. But it's a good segue because the machines used for particle physics research are truly extraordinary. I mean, without them, we would just be staring really intently into space and not making a whole lot of progress. Uh, the nominees this year also remind us that the time scale for physics is very long and that old dogs can learn new tricks. The nominees for best supporting equipment are the D0 experiment in You've Got Data. In this heartwarming tale, the D0 experiment at Fermilab produced mountains of data before retiring in 2011. A decade later, it combined with an experiment at CERN to discover the Otteron, a particle that researchers had been looking for for 50 years. Icarus in Ghost Particle Busters. The Icarus detector studied hard to catch neutrinos in Italy until 2014. It was then refurbished and shipped overseas to Fermilab. It will begin attempts to track and capture a fourth kind of neutrino called the sterile neutrino later this year. The muon G-2 magnet in Return of the Ring this epic fantasy was 20 years in the making. The superconducting storage ring found hints of an anomaly in an experiment at Brookhaven National Lab in 2001. The magnet was moved to Fermilab so the experiment could be upgraded and repeated. Researchers confirmed the anomaly earlier this month. And the award goes to... Muon G-2 magnet. Oh my gosh! This is amazing. I can't believe it. Uh, first off, I have to thank all of the muons that circulated inside me. I wanted them to come up on stage with me, but they decayed after two millionths of a second. Um, uh, everyone, uh, DOE, HFPA, MC1, Brookhaven, the transport team. I should have written a list. I'm so sorry if I'm forgetting you, but you know who you are and I thank you. Um, oh, the, the team that shimmed my magnetic field until it was insanely uniform. You are amazing. Uh, the laser calibration system, the simulations, the analysis team. Oh, I'm, I'm out of time, but there are so many other people, the international partners, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for this incredible honor. Terrific. Our next award is for most confusing equation. Is that? I'm being told that we are out of time. We'll publish the rest of the award winners in a reputable journal. Thank you for tuning in and join us next year for the second annual Golden Particles.
I would just like to thank all of the people that helped me, like Andre Salz made the music, and I would like to thank all of the physicists and scientists at Fermilab who have taught me everything that I know about physics. Thank you.